moment to stand back and think about all the, the cosmic processes that can pervade and are operating in our lives every day. And so one of these processes that I'm going to talk to you about tonight is chaos theory. And it applies to each and every one of us, whether we are aware of it or not. So this is a, a good definition of chaos theory that comes from Edward Lorenz's seminal paper from Deterministic Non-Periodic Flow in 1963. He was not the inventor of chaos theory, but he was definitely a pioneer in characterizing his behavior. So this is, I'll, I'll read it slow so it also gives people a chance to read it. Two states differing by imperceptible amounts may eventually evolve into two considerably different states. If then there is any error whatsoever in observing the present state, and in any real system such errors seem inevitable, an acceptable prediction of an instantaneous state in the distant future may very well be impossible. So we're going to explore this over the course of the lecture and hopefully give you a sense of what this actually means. So what are some of the characteristics of chaos theory? So for one, it operates on all scales. From the biggest galaxies to the smallest particles, chaos theory is at work. Second, it also applies to living and non-living things and systems that are composed of both. Chaos theory is also operating there. And three, chaos tends to apply on very complicated systems, which is often why it's sometimes difficult to discern what's the chaos and what's just the complicated system part, because there's so many moving parts, it's often difficult to grasp exactly what's going on. So chaos in space. There's many different forms of chaos, but I'm going to give you the version that I know best, which is applied to astronomy and to space. So this is the most simple system we can construct in space. This shows a planet orbiting around a star. So is this a chaotic system? I want people to raise their hand if you think this is a chaotic system. A couple people. Raise your hand if you think it's not a chaotic system. A couple people. More people? No, it is not a chaotic system. It is an integrable system. Okay, what's an integrable system? So, I was looking around on, on the internet for what's a good definition of what is an integrable system. So this is from Wikipedia. <laughs> Integrability means that there exists a regular foliation of the phase space by invariant manifolds such that the Hamiltonian vector fields associated with the invariance of the foliation span the tangent distribution. That's not, that's not going to work. That's not going to work for us. Okay, so, so, so let's go to a different source. So now we're going to go to Scholarpedia. Integrability means that there exists a maximal set of Poisson community invariants. Okay, that's also not quite going to work for us. So, so it, it turns out I looked around online for, for various definitions of what is an integrable system. I couldn't actually find a good one, so I had to come up with my own, which I'll admit is not a perfect definition, but I think for the purposes of this lecture it will suffice. Integrability means that a system can be solved for any time in the past or future just using a pen and a paper. So what do I mean by this? So let's say we have our system, a planet and a star, at time equals zero. And we want to know, what is it going to be like in a billion years? Well, it turns out that just using a pen and paper we can solve Kepler's equations and we can figure out, oh, this is where the, the planet is going to be in the future. So now let's watch a video, a simulation of this system, a planet going around a star. So you can see the planet's going around and it, it looks like it's not really doing very much. It's almost like it's stuck on a wire and it's just going round and round. And here, here's time down here, you can't maybe see it, but it's 4,000 years, 4,500. And it looks like a very typical system, you know, not much is happening. And so you could imagine that maybe with a pen and a paper you could figure out what it's going to look like in the future. Okay, let's do the next most complicated thing we can do. We're going to add one more planet. So now we have two planets and a star. Raise your hand if you think this is a chaotic system. Raise your hand if you think it's not a chaotic system. This is a chaotic system. So this is also known as a non-integrable system. Okay, so what's a non-integrable system? Well, it's kind of the opposite of the integrable system. But what does that mean? What are the implications? So if I have this system here at time equals zero, and again I want to figure out what is it going to look like in a billion years. Turns out I cannot use a pen and paper to figure this out. Instead, I have to use simulation techniques. I have to use a simulator 
to nudge it forward every, every little bit all the way to a billion years. And so it turns out that the way these simulations work is there are these approximations you can make that for very small amounts of time are good approximations, but if you extended that all the way to a billion years and just tried to jump from here to there, it would totally break down. It definitely wouldn't work. So what we have to do is we have to nudge it forward, recalibrate, nudge it forward, recalibrate, nudge it forward all the way until you get to a billion years. This is why scientists need supercomputers, because these are non-integrable systems. We can't just write it down what the answer is. We actually need computers in order to simulate the system forward and figure out what it's going to look like in the future. So now I'm going to show you chaos embodied in this solar system. So I'm going to show you two simulations. The first will be one simulation, and then I'm going to nudge the parameters, I'm going to nudge the initial conditions just a little bit, and you'll see the second simulation. And I want you guys to compare the two. So here's the first one. You can see that they're, they're, they're bouncing around a little bit, but overall the, it's, it's fairly regular. You know, they're still going round and round. Nothing in particular is happening too much. They're just bouncing around a little bit. Okay, so now we're going to watch the second one. I, and I just changed the initial conditions just a little bit. So it's starting off, it's not really doing too much again. But then all of a sudden, this really interesting behavior starts happening. They're jumping around between each other. You can see all these very interesting interactions happening. It's almost like they're dancing with one another. And so this is chaos embodied. And so what was the difference between the first simulation and the second simulation? All I did was take the initial position of that planet and just move it just a little bit. I didn't change the masses, I didn't change the positions, I just changed the initial position of that first planet and we get that drastically different behavior. Let's watch the simulations one more time because this is really key and crucial to chaos. So here's the first one again. And so both of these, it's not that this, is, this one is not chaotic and the other one is. These are both part of a chaotic family and, and it's, it's de defined by just changing the initial conditions a little bit lead to very drastically different solutions. And so here's the second one. So now you can see again that they're really dancing with each other, really having, and so you can imagine that it would be difficult to, to write down with just a pen and paper all the complexities of these interactions. It'd be very difficult to figure that out exactly, and especially if you don't know the initial conditions exactly, then it'd be hard to discern between one solution and the second. So now let's return back to our definition, and I'll just paraphrase it a little bit. So two states that differ by just small amounts can evolve into radically different states, and if there's any error in knowing the present state, then knowing the future is also very difficult. So that's why the weatherman is usually wrong. You know, he just... <laughs> If we, you know, we can't measure the temperature of today exactly. You know, we know it's 23 and a half degrees, but we don't know it's 23.54678. You know, you know, you can keep going. And if there's any difference there, then if you try to predict the weather 30 days from now, it's still going to be wrong. And that's because we don't know everything precisely. In, on the astronomy side, when we look out into space, we've now discovered a lot of different planetary systems, but you know, we, we know roughly how big it is and roughly how far away it is, but we don't know those quantities to exact precision. But since we know that they're chaotic, then we have to run many different simulations and we have to consider all the possibilities in order to try and get a, uh, an accurate answer of what the possible evolution could be like. And so usually our answers are more statistical in nature, so it'll be maybe something like there's a 30% chance that these two planets are going to collide, but it won't be, this is definitely going to collide at this time in the future, because we can't know everything exactly. So, now I'm going to show you a little bit of my own research, the kind of simulations that I run on a daily basis. So this is actually using code that I, that I built myself. It's called Hermes. And it, uh, it basically took about a year for me to build, so it took, took quite a long time. But it was able to, to, to allow me to simulate these very complicated systems. So, let's, so, so in the system, we picture the asteroid belt and we have a planet inside that asteroid belt. And so let's see what the evolution is going to look like. So we're going to zoom up here, just showing you the initial configuration. Here's the star, here's all these asteroids, and then there's a planet hi hidden somewhere in there. So now when we start the simulation, then we can see that very quickly, Things are getting shaken up. Asteroids are getting flung all over the place. 
And when I turn on the orbit trajectories, you can see all the calculations that the simulator is making every second. And it's rearranging all these orbits, and you can see how they're evolving in time. And then as, and so, so you can see the time here, it's going much slower. This is only 55 years, 56. In the other simulations, it'd be like thousands of years by now. So now we're gonna zoom up, and we're gonna see the planet, and we're seeing all the complicated interactions that these, those asteroids are having with the planet. You can imagine that it's very complex and very chaotic behavior that's happening. As I showed you before, uh, only three bodies, two planets and a star, can create chaos. And so all these bodies, you can imagine just how chaotic these systems are. <clears throat> There's just the orbits one more time, just to give you a sense of what's going on here. Okay, so now that we're armed with a little bit of chaos theory and a, and a sense of what it is, let's apply it to some specific systems instead of just a generic system like this. There just is from the side view, but we're going to move on. <laughs> so chaos in the solar system. So, as we were just talking about, chaos with just three bodies is already chaotic. The solar system is composed of billions and billions of particles. And so if we were to say, go back in time to the beginning, the formation of the solar system, and let's say we took that asteroid and moved it over here and then started the whole solar system over again, it's such a chaotic system that we could end up with a drastically different result. When I personally run simulations of the solar system, if we just change the initial conditions slightly, then maybe the Earth doesn't form in that situation, or maybe Jupiter is twice as big or something like that. And, and so chaos is very pervasive in the solar system and also in our lives, which I'm going to get to a little bit later. So the premier model which describes the formation of the solar system is called the Nice model. It's developed in 2005. There's been some modifications along the way, but the essence of the theory was created then. So this is a simulation by Hal Levinson. Uh, it's on YouTube. That's where I pulled it from. You can just look online if you want to. And right, so, so this is simulating the outer solar system in particular. So these are the orbits. This is just X position and Y position. And so here we have the outer planets, and then we have a large body of asteroids. So this is called the Kuiper Belt. It's like an asteroid belt beyond Pluto. And so we get, set the simulation going. You can see there's millions of years up there. And then all of a sudden, it's a very chaotic event right here, which scatters everything. And so that is a very sensitive period in our solar system. And so if we, that particular moment, if we do that over again and we see what are the resulting orbits, then very often the configuration is not like this. And so when you're thinking about the formation of our solar system, especially in that particular moment, if you change things just a little bit, we can get drastically different results. So the moon. The moon is another example of chaos in our solar system. So those who know me a little bit more personally know that I love the moon. Like it's very special object for me. And so the, especially these craters that we see here, these are actually craters that were supposed to have formed during that great instability. In that simulation, that Nice model we just saw, that, that part that I pointed out where the orbits changed drastically and they sent asteroids flying everywhere, some of those asteroids slammed into the moon and that's supposed to be the scars from that ancient time when the solar system was still forming embodied on the moon right there. But more than those craters, the formation of the moon itself is also very chaotic. So the formation of the moon is supposed to have happened with a Mars-sized object crashing into the primordial Earth. And so in this collision, there was a ton of debris that was sent out into space, and out of that debris, the moon formed out of that. But this formation is also very sensitive to the initial conditions and also very chaotic. And so I'm going to show you some simulations right now. So this simulation we're showing, here's the Earth, and here is the, the primordial object that struck and collided with, uh, with the Earth. And so this is done by John Dubinsky at our very own U University of Toronto. And so once that collision happens, it sends particles flying out in all directions. And you can see that very quickly, the center, it, it, it's hard to tell which one was the orange one, which one was the blue one. It all just kind of looks like a big mess. And there's also particles that are just flung out in all directions. 
It turns out the moon, in order for the moon to form, we require a thin disk of particles to be uh, basically a, a little disk surrounding the Earth, and then the moon is supposed to form out of that. But, but we don't see a disk here. We just see kind of particles in all directions. But now, I'm just going to change the initial conditions just a little bit, and let's see what happens. So here's the initial conditions before, and now here's the new ones. So now let's see what happens here. So we can see this one kind of grazing encounter, but already it's very different than the initial simulation. There's only one collision in the first one, but now it's, they're going, they're kind of still, now they're spinning a little bit too, and they're coming back for a second pass. It kind of looks like it's happening in slow motion, but uh, this, is, this is real time, baby. <laughs> so uh, you can see that uh, now, now they're finally merging, and now you can see this disk is starting to form. They're starting to throw out these particles in a nice disk-like fashion, unlike the first scenario. But there's also something that's not quite right about this simulation too, because the Earth is very uniform in its composition. It's not like half of it is orange and half of it is blue. It's all kind of mishmashed all together. And so both of these simulations have their attributes. In the first case, this was a big soup of particles, which we want, but it didn't have the disk of particles. But in this case, we have the disk of particles, but it's not a big soup in the middle, uniform soup. And so you can see just how sensitive the conditions are and how hard it is to get it exactly right. And so we still are exploring the formation of the moon and we still don't have that perfect recipe for how the moon was formed. Okay. The next object I want to talk about is Mars. So Mars is really unique for a different reason, not in its formation history, but in its current ongoing evolution. So as most people know, we have seasons on the Earth, and the seasons come from the tilt that the Earth has. So the Earth is about 23 and a half degrees, and Mars is about 25 degrees. So they're about the same. You'd imagine that Mars might have similar seasons that the Earth would. But there's a very critical difference, and this is the evolution of the axial tilt. That's a fancy word for it, the axial tilt over time. So this graph, I know it's, whoa, there's a graph here, but I'll, I'll explain it. So this is, this is time in millions of years, and this is axial tilt in degrees. So this is the evolution of Mars' axial tilt over time. And so over, over millions of years, the axial tilt actually changes very significantly from zero degrees right here, so it's, it's kind of facing it directly up, to 60 degrees, where it's quite lopsided. And over the course of millions of years, it chaotically varies. It changes unpredictably. We can't predict how it's going to look like in the future. And so you can imagine this would have very huge ramifications if Earth varied in this way. I mean, humans have thrived because of the very stable conditions over time. And if, and if, and if, uh, and if Earth varied in such a way, then we definitely wouldn't have complex life on Earth. We wouldn't have animals. We might still have bacteria and all that good stuff, but we wouldn't necessarily have the, the animal life that we, you know, we, we appreciate that animal life for sure. So you can see here's Earth, and it varies a little bit, but it's still quite stable. But there's kind of a shocking fact here. If Earth had no moon, then Earth would vary this way as well. And so if the Earth didn't have a moon, then that's this green curve here. And so Earth would vary chaotically from zero degrees all the way to 80 degrees. And so if it was 80 degrees, that's basically like the reversal of the poles. And so the equator would now become the North and South Pole, and then the North and South Pole would become the equator. And so you can imagine that that wouldn't be good for, for a number of reasons. You know, if we had no moon, like first of all, oh my gosh, we have no moon. Like I can't think about that. <laughs> And then also, like, we wouldn't be alive, and that would, like, suck too, so <laughs> it, wouldn't really be, it wouldn't really be very well good at all. But, but as, we, as we talked about, it's now kind of chaos multiplying on top of chaos, because the formation of the moon is very chaotic, and if we didn't have the moon, then we wouldn't be around to tell the tale as well, and so it's just a lot of chaotic things that have contributed to our lives. Okay, so bounded chaos. This is a really interesting avenue, which I've only learned about a little bit more recently. But one, one question you might be thinking of is, well, if things are chaotic, then like, how do you figure out anything about it? Like, if it can be anything, then like, what's the point of investigating it? But it turns out that most chaos, it has 
bounds to it. There's limits that we can impose. So we can't tell exactly what it's going to be, but we know it'll be within this certain region. So this is a very famous pro uh, problem, project, problem in astronomy. And this arises when the masses of the bodies are very, very different. So in mathematical terms, the mass of the sun is much greater than the mass of the earth, which is also much greater than the mass of the asteroid. Sun, earth, asteroid. And so this problem was famously studied by Carl Gustav Jacob Jacobi in the 1800s, a long time ago. The kind of field that I study is actually over 300 years old. It's a very ancient history, but only recently with computers have we been able to actually investigate much more problems because they didn't really have computers back then and there's no other way to write down what's gonna happen on a pen and paper as I talked about earlier. And so he came up with a famous integral. So we, we've learned about integral before, which is predicting the future. But then you also know that this involves three bodies, which, which is chaotic. And so in this situation, it's kind of like the sweet spot where we can tell something about the future, but not exactly everything about the future. And so he came up with this equation, which means that the x and y position of the asteroid, so this is x and y, is dependent upon the mass of the sun, the radius of the sun, and then the mass and the radius of the Earth. And that is always a constant. And so particularly what this means is the following. It means that the asteroid is always bounded to the blue regions. And no matter what, it cannot leave those blue regions. And so even though I can't tell you exactly where it's going to be in a billion years, I can tell you for sure it's going to be in the blue region. And so if we start the asteroid inside the blue region here, there's no way the asteroid can end up close to the sun. And vice versa, if we start it close to the sun, there's no way it could end up close to the Earth. Maybe that's a little bit more, oh, oh yeah, sorry. And, and so if we replace it with Jupiter, then the situation changes a little bit. There's actually a little bit of an overlap region. And so you could, you could only make the statement, I know it's not going to be in the black region. It'll either be close to the sun or close to Jupiter, but I can't tell you again exactly where it's going to be. In context of your life, we also have some bounded chaos. You know, let's say you're thinking about, you're, you're a little bit younger, or maybe you are young, and you're thinking about what you want to be when you grow up, maybe. You know, maybe you could be uh, work for the police force. Or maybe you could be a businessman, or maybe a school teacher. But there's no way you could be a dragon tamer. Like, there's just no way that that could happen. <laughs> Hope I'm not crushing any dreams here, but there's just no way that uh, that's, it's not going to work out. And so similar to how you cannot be a dragon tamer, that asteroid physically can't jump from the sun to the Earth if it doesn't start in those places. Okay. So I'm starting to get a little bit towards the end of my talk. Well, not quite, but it's the latter half of the talk. So I want to get into a little bit of chaos theory and life and how chaos affects our lives. So the butterfly effect. Raise your hand if you've seen the butterfly effect. Okay, quite a few people. So for those who haven't, this is based off of chaos theory. And so in this movie, Ashton Kutcher, the handsome devil, is trying to end up with Amy Smart, and he has this ability to write in his diary, go back in time, change one little thing about his past, and then jump back to the future and see how things changed. And the object of his, his goal is to end up with, with Amy Smart, but it turns out no matter how hard he tries, there's always these unintended consequences, and he never can quite end up with the girl of his dreams. And so this movie was inspired based off of Edward Lorenz's quote that he made back in the 60s. A butterfly flapping its wings in South America can cause a tornado in Texas. So, is that true? <laughs> can a butterfly flapping its wings cause a tornado in Texas? And so if, if you take that quote literally, then, then so many questions keep coming up. Like, like, What's so special about butterflies? You know, if I flap my arms, can I start a tornado in Texas too? And then if I flap them this way, can I stop a tornado from happening too? You know, maybe America's whole defense budget is just people flapping their arms or something like that. We don't need money for anything else. And so, <laughs> if you take the quote literally, then it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But the point that Edward Lorenz is trying to make is that the Earth and, and humans living on the Earth, it's very, very chaotic, very sensitive to the initial conditions. So I'm going to give a, a, an example in context of my own life. So every Sunday, I go to my grandmother's house 
my Oma's house. And when I'm there, she always makes me food. <laughs> we always play Yahtzee. And she always tells me stories about when she was younger. And so in particular, <laughs> in particular is the story of how she came to Canada, which I'm going to share with you all right now. So she was born in Dusseldorf in 1928 in Germany. And when World War II happened, then she was first sent to Austria for a very brief period of time, and then was supposed to go to Norway, but actually ended up in Sweden instead. So when she was in Sweden, she worked on a farm, and she ended up meeting her husband, my opa, my grandfather. And after the war, they were deciding, should we go to Sweden or should we go to Canada? After a lot of deliberation, they finally ended up in Canada, in Toronto, <laughs> where they then had my mom, who met my dad, who then had me. <laughs> and in the family tree, this is what it looks like. So now that we have kind of the basic relationship, this is my, this is my dad's side, I didn't really talk too much about them, but, but we'll just take that for granted right now. And so now that we have this family tree, let's explore it just a little bit. Situation one, what would have happened to me if my Oma instead went to Norway, as was orig originally planned? Well, she never would have met my Opa, my Opa was in Sweden, never would have had my mom, and therefore, I never could have been born. Let's look at another situation. What if, after the war, they decided to stay in Sweden, and they decided not to move to Canada? Well then, my mom still would have been born, presumably, my dad would have been born as well, but my mom would have lived in Sweden, and my dad would have lived in Toronto, and they never would have met. It's very unlikely they would have met. So again, bad news for me. Would not have been around. So if my Oma, so if we just break this down a little bit more, if my Oma decides I want to have a child, the probability that that child is going to be someone is 100%. You know, very good chance. If she's going to have a child, the child's going to be someone. But the probability that the child is going to be my mom specifically is actually very, very small. One could actually make the argument that there's only a single chain of events that lead to the birth of my mom. And if anything else had been different, then a new person would have been born instead. And if that new person was born instead, then it's very unlikely that I would have been born in, ter uh, in turn. So, you know, if, if a boy was, was born instead, then just unfortunately they can't together make a child. At least that I know of. Uh, at least that I know of. Anyways. And you can extend this example as far back as you want to go. In order for me to be born, my mom has to be born. In order for my mom to be born, my Oma has to be born. In order for my Oma to be born, then her mother has to be born. And then her Oma has to be born. And you keep going all the way, <laughs> if you want to, to, to prehistoric times. You can go back as far as... And it seems kind of crazy to think about, you know, how... I have nothing to do with prehistoric times. But, you know, everyone, they all have their choices and their big life events. You know, if there was Facebook back then, the things that they would be throwing on Facebook like it's nobody's business. And so they all have these choices that they make and they all trail down into the present day. And so in order for me, me to be alive here today, kind of everything has to happen exactly the way it did in order for me to be around. And so that's kind of a little bit also to what Edward Lorenz was talking about when he was talking about a butterfly flapping its wings over here can cause a tornado over there. Again, don't take it, <laughs> don't take it too literally, but uh, it's kind of the, the, the symbol behind it that, that it's pretty well true, at least so far, that we know of. So another way to maybe state his quote is, if Oma had stayed in Sweden, I never would have been born. I want to give you guys one last example of chaos theory in our lives. So this is the great tree of world religions. And so here at the base is religions from a long time ago. And then as we get to the leaves, then we actually get to the present day. And so there's a particular region that I want to zoom up on. Right there. So you could, I actually spent a long time just going through this and just think, like there's so much information here, you can zoom up all the way there. So if you guys just Google it up, then there's a lot of cool stuff in there. So let's go to this particular place. So it's hard to see what all the names are, so I'll point all the key stuff out. 
So this is the main bloodline of the Roman Catholic Church. And here is where a very influential figure lived, Martin Luther, in Germany from 1483 to 1546. So if we just move over here a little bit, here is the birth of the Protestant Reformation. And so if there's anyone here who's Protestant, then, then you are Protestant because he was around to be there. It's, it's believed that he was the primary influential figure that created the Pro Protestant Revolution. And without him, then it probably wouldn't happen the way it was. So, so if we see all these religions that are branching off of it, I see there's Baptists here, and there's uh, Lutheran, and there's Mennonites, and Evangelical. There's tons of sub-religions that have branched off of the Protestant Reformation. But, you know, as all good Germans are, they have an Oma. And so, you know, instead of Oma, his Oma being, you know, a very devout Christian, what if, you know, she instead, like, I don't know, pursued that disco career or something like that? Then, you know, Martin Luther may not have been grown up with the, or raised with the same values that he had, and as a result, then maybe he wouldn't have been as influential a figure as he was. And therefore, the Protestant Revolution may not have happened exactly the way it did. Okay, so now getting to the end of my talk, and I'd like to kind of take a step back again and give you maybe a little bit of a cosmic perspective or something like that. So when I, day to day, when I go about my day, even though I am thinking about chaos theory, I'm not thinking about its influence on my life. I'm thinking about why well, I want this code compiled, why isn't my simulation working, I need to get this paper submitted, my room is a chaotic mess. There's all of these things that involve chaos, but it's not really its influence on my life. And yet, when I go out at night, as you guys will do soon, when you guys go up on the roof, then when I look up at the stars, I can't help but think about chaos theory and its influence on my life. In order for me to be here right now, talking to all of you about chaos theory, literally all of the universe's events had to happen exactly as they did. From the birth of the universe, to the formation of the solar system, to the formation of the moon and the earth, to the extinction of the dinosaurs, to all of my ancestors procreating and meeting exactly the way they did. And if any of those things had been different, it's quite possible that I wouldn't be around here to, to talk to, you, to all of you tonight. And so when we look into the future, then all of us, whether we know it or not, whether we're just going about our normal day, we're all having a very real influence and impact on the direction of the universe. Maybe we won't all be you know, famous movie stars or professional sports players and be Encarnacion just hitting that great home run. I wish I could be that so badly, but, uh, but we're all still having a very real influence on our surroundings and, and guiding the universe into the future. And so, as I conclude this talk, I hope that you guys all got a, a good sense of what chaos theory is all about, and hopefully I've given you guys a sense of a little bit of that cosmic perspective. So I'll take any questions now. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, yep. It appears that, um, would you agree that chaos theory is basically randomness or chance, in a sense? Uh, no. So his question was, is chaos basically randomness or chance? This is actually something I was going to talk about, but I didn't, so I'm glad you asked this. Chaos is actually very different than chance. So let's say, as an example, let's say that we had, you're flipping coins, and you flipped three coins in a row, and you're going to flip the, the next coin, and you're asking the question, is it going to be heads or is it going to be tails? A random process, if you flip three coins and you flip that next coin, you don't know if it's going to be heads or tails. It's purely random. But chaos, they're very complicated pro processes, but they're still very predictable. They're still very deterministic. So for example, if I run one of my simulations on my computer, if I run it with exactly the same initial conditions, then I'll get exactly the same answer at the end. The, the problem with chaos is if you just change the initial conditions a little bit, you'll get a drastically different answer. But if you run the same experiment exactly the same way, and, and with computers you can do that, you can be as precise as you want to be, then you will get the same answer each time. So that's kind of a, a crucial difference between randomness and chaos. Yep? One of the things, I mean, this kind of builds on that question because I've just learned about big things about 
deterministic versus probabilistic systems and all that, and then it seems like some things are purely probabilistic, but then chaos so are deterministic. I guess how does, does that really have the nature of physics of behind our universe? Does it kind of paint it as chaotic yet deterministic, or is there possible that kind of probabilistic component that's thrown on top of the chaos? I'm going to try and repeat his question so that everyone can hear. So he was essentially saying, how do you discern between randomness and chaos? Is that kind of... Kind of that, and his uh, argument, I guess probability and with the universe means like probabilistic with chaos. Sure. A hybrid kind of uh, yeah, so, so uh, most systems, I, so, so I, I don't know this answer for sure, but I'm going to give you my sense of, of that answer. Um, I think that all systems have an element of randomness and an element of chaos. But it, it's really hard, especially from our standpoint as humans, to know. Like, for example, you know, the Brexit that happened this year, was that a random event or was that a careful plot from, not from people, but from, like, the world? Well, you know, if, if you had, if you could, were the master of math and could solve all these equations that you want, could you have come to the conclusion, oh, a Brexit, Brexit's happening three months from now? Or did it just kind of come out of nowhere? It's really hard to know, and especially when you know, humans, we're, we're logical in some sense, but we're very emotional as well. And so emotion and, and quantifying that to the, to, into you know, chaotic equations, that's really hard to, to know. So I would say that sometimes you can tell this is definitely chaos, and sometimes you can tell this is definitely randomness, but it's really hard to know in between what is random and what is chaotic. Yeah, yeah. Certainly there are systems that have a mix of both. Like the weather is, I think, somewhat random, somewhat chaotic, but, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Way in the back. Right at the beginning, you had the one object and another object in it. Yeah. And then you had the one object. Yes. And that seemed like a stable. Yep. Yep. Right, so the thing that I changed, so, uh, so, sorry, so the question was, I had in my first simulation with three bodies, two planets and a star, then it seemed pretty regular, and then I changed something, and then I got this very different and obviously chaotic behavior. So the thing that I changed was the initial position of the second planet in the orbit. So, so planets, they go around like this, and so initially I started the two planets like this, and then I let it go and see what happened. In the second simulation, I just took this planet and I moved it over here. And then I started the simulation again. That's the only thing I did. And then that resulted in that very different behavior. So same radius. Same radius. Just a different position. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, let's get all the way in the back. Oh man, that's that's a whole different that's a whole different beast. Uh, I, Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. He said, how does quantum entanglement fit into all this? I think the scientists are still figuring that out. And so that could be a very mysterious, but still a very simple process. And by simple, I mean that it's, oh, well, if we, if we you know, put in a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that, then we get entanglement. Um, and so it might be kind of a recipe that's very difficult to understand, but it might just be a recipe. Um, but Chaos, is, is, I think, is something entirely different. But um, I'm definitely not the expert on quantum entanglement, so that's, that's my sense of the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, this sort of has to do with the question about the two, the two planets yep. and the star. I understand that two is more than one. Yes. But when you have one star and one planet, you go, yes, I can tell exactly what it will be like. Yes. When you have two, you go, no, I can't tell. Now, assuming you knew everything about both planets and the star, you knew their mass, you knew the radius, you knew everything else. Yes. Why is the fact that there's two rather than one something that you cannot predict, assuming you know everything that you have to know? I would say if I knew every single thing to arbitrary precision that I needed to know, then I would say that I could predict things quite well into a very long, you know, it, as precise as you want to go, then that will in turn decide how accurate and predictable I can be in the future. But the nature, because in general, regardless of the precision that you know, because there's three bodies, then it's by definition a chaotic system, and therefore you'd still have to use a simulator in order to find out the answer. You could know that answer pretty darn well precise, 
but it's not as perfect and as and, and so the, the, the meaning behind that and, and the deep philosophical reason why, maybe we'll talk about it right after. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit more of a conversation. So maybe you stick around and maybe we'll, we'll try and talk about that. Yeah, uh, I haven't got anyone over here yet. Let's get you. Um, one, one, two quick questions. One is further reading, aside from uh, James Glick's book, anything, anything else you'd recommend, either planetary or otherwise? But just Yeah, uh, hmm. All of my uh, books that I read, they're like very, they're like solar system dynamics, but I don't know if you want to, that's like a very, that's like four researchers. I don't know if you want to, uh, oh man, so I, I actually do have a list of books uh, not in my mind, but in, yeah, so maybe again, maybe we'll have to, to be continued. And second, yeah. One other quick question, I'm assuming the three is the minimum number of variables needed for a chaotic system. In in astronomy, um, is, I, is I there, astronomy aside, is it, is it possible to have a chaotic system with only two variables? I would. My intuition is yes, but I can't think of all the possibilities. I mean, if you and and also it's hard to. I mean, space is really simple because yeah. it's very free of external things. If you have just a planet and a star sitting in the middle of space, there's not a lot of external variables. But you know, if I say, oh, well, if I'm just walking through the world, there's just one of me. But I mean, it's hard to separate me from the environment. And so it's kind of hard to isolate that. But in the context of space, so maybe if you have two animals, then maybe there could be some chaotic processes between them. <laughs> Mathematically? Mathematically? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, I don't think I can tell you yes or no for sure out of all the mathematical theory. I, I know chaos through an astronomical lens. Sure. I unfortunately am not like a super genius guru, so uh, I, I, my intuition says yes, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, I'll hit you up with both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, so you got things going chaos, chaotic. Couldn't you just ask either the magnetic field or the electric field how long it's going to take before it puts the chaos into its order? Uh, so electric fields and magnetic fields uh, certainly could play a role, I agree. If the, so if the planet was very close, so, so uh, sorry, uh, so the question that he was saying is, uh, <laughs> so couldn't the star, the electric and magnetic fields, induce chaos on the planet? No. Oh? No, I'm saying they're in chaos, but we have electric fields or magnetic or gravity fields, okay. and they would dictate and they would tell you exactly when they were going to put this chaos into order. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily true. I think that if you have planets that are undergoing chaos and then you throw some electric and magnetic fields in there, I don't think that'll necessarily uh, relinquish the chaos. I think that that could even contribute to the chaos because the electric fields and the magnetic fields, they're not going to be perfectly uniform in all directions. There'll be some small inconsistencies and as the planet moves from the, through that field, it might go a little bit faster and then a little bit slower. And then if it ha it's having an encounter simultaneously, then maybe it goes a little bit this way instead of a little bit that way. And I think that it could be very chaotic as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yep. I think just an extension of this question, um, if we have a chaotic, chaotic system, in a long term, looking at a long term, long uh, time span, do you think, or not do you think, but in general, do we often have density taking over and get more and more chaotic, or do we have equilibrium to take over and things generally get less chaotic? So, uh, uh, so <laughs> the question was when you throw entropy, entropy into the mix, then does that uh, resolve or further create more chaos? Is it, am I? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, I would say that entropy um, is a little bit different again from chaos. Cer certainly, there is a there is a connection between chaos and entropy. But for example, I showed that example with the asteroid, and I showed that we can't predict exactly where it's going to be, but we know that it's going to be bounded to this region. So in that sense, the at least for the long-term future, that asteroid is really bounded to that region, and, and if you were thinking about it from an entropy perspective, maybe that, that circle would enlarge, and only when like, the asteroid starts to disintegrate, because like, the protons can't you know, keep the bonds together, then maybe something else would happen, and so that would be entropy kind of breaking it down, or maybe the sun starts to go into you know, a red giant phase, and then that would alter the system, and so entropy from that sense certainly would change the system a little bit, but... 
Uh, I don't think that you necessarily would lose the chaos. Uh, like anytime you have three bodies, at least in astronomy, then, then like mathematically you can show that there's going to be chaos. So, so maybe one way that you could change that is if you, you know, have three bodies, but if you separate, put one way over there and the star way over there, and then put one here, then the chaos could be minimized, and that would be an example with three bodies. But uh, in general, if you have three bodies or more, then it's going to be chaotic. One more, question. one more question. One more question. You look like you really want to ask a question. Yes, yes it is. So uh, the, it's called the late heavy bombardment and it's supposed to happen about 600 million years after the formation of the solar system. So, so that's 4.5 billion was the formation of the solar system. 3.9 is about when we time the asteroid, uh, the, the impacts and the scars on the moon. And so that we, we had those dating records from you know, when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, we physically got the moon rocks, and then when we took it back, then we could analyze it, and, and when we date it, that's, that's the kind of ages that we get. Thank you all for your questions. So before I let you go and applaud Ari again, I'd like to make just a few announcements. On your way in, you received a feedback form. As a group of graduate student volunteers, we really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill that out. I've got cookies at the front for people to do, as well as pencils if you need something to fill out your form. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that there will be Planetarium show tickets available for the last two shows of the night at 9.45 and at 10 p.m. If you sign up for a Planetarium show online or pick up one of these tickets, you will meet a Planetarium ambassador in front of the elevators downstairs. So down the stairs and in that direction. Your ambassadors for this evening are Jessica, who will take you to the 9.15 show, and Elisa, who will take you to the 9.15 the final two shows. You can pick up tickets for those outside this room uh, from Dana and Elisa, if you could wait as well. So those are the people you're going to need to keep track of tonight. As always, we invite you to come upstairs for our telescopes to check out our 3D printed models, explore the universe with the Worldwide Telescope or with the Oculus Rift virtual reality headset, and I'll leave a map up here for you to find those. Let's all applaud Ari again. Thanks for